Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to The Way the Word Ministries Television Ministry. As always, I'm honored to be here sharing God's Word with each and every one of you, and we are still in our series, The Miracles and Parables of Jesus. We've been in this series for a while now, but we've been having a whole lot of fun, and I hope that every one of you is, just like me, learning a whole lot. Well, Today, the title of the message is, Why Climb It When You Can Move It? This is message number 22 in the series, and we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 18 through 22. There was a little boy, and his name was Tommy, and Tommy was in first grade Sunday school, and he was faithful to be there every week because he loved his Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Smith. And Mrs. Smith, she told these wonderful Bible stories, and at the end of each one, she'd say, and boys and girls, the moral is, and then she'd tell the moral of uh, the story. But as time goes on, and as time always does go on, there came a time when a little Tommy, he had to move to a second grade Sunday school, and he got a new teacher, Mrs. Jones. And uh, Mrs. Jones, she told wonderful Bible study stories too, but uh, she didn't end them with a moral. She didn't tell the moral at the end. Well, about uh, three weeks in, Tommy's mom said to him, Tommy, how do you like your new Sunday school teacher? And he said, well, uh, Mrs. Jones is all right, Mom, but uh, she doesn't have any morals. <laughs> <laughs> you and I, we've been studying the miracles and parables of Jesus for a good while now. And every one of Jesus' miracles and parables ends with not just a moral, but with a literal application, a spiritual application, and even a personal application for each and every one of us. Now, as we look at our verses for today, I want you to remember that we are in a part of the book of Matthew, because that's what we're doing. We're studying the miracles and parables of Jesus in the book of Matthew. And we are in the book of Matthew in a place where it's the last week leading up uh, to the cross. The last time we were uh, together, uh, we looked at some events that took place on what you and I referred to as Palm Sunday. That's where Jesus, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and his first order of business was to drive out the dishonest merchants who had uh, set up shop there. Again, this is that final week in Jerusalem before the cross, and this is Passover week, and we're looking at the things that Jesus said and did. Jesus would spend his day there in Jerusalem teaching in the temple courts, and then in the evening, he'd walk back to Bethany to spend the night. Bethany was about a mile away over on the other side of the Mount of Olives. The Bible doesn't say where Jesus stayed when he was in Bethany, but since that's where Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived, there's a good chance that Jesus stayed with them. We don't know for sure, but there's a good chance that he did. What we do know for sure is that every morning Jesus and his disciples, they'd walk back over the crest of the Mount of Olives down into the Kidron Valley and then back up to the temple courts. Now, when we get into our verses here, I want you to understand it's Monday morning now, and Jesus and his disciples, they're heading down the Mount of Olives, and they're on their way back to Jerusalem. And again, remember, this is Passover week, and so there are a whole lot of Jewish pilgrims there in Jerusalem. So let's pick up our verses now. Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 22, early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. 
In our message today, we're going to examine a miracle that's really a parable, the withered fig tree. And then we're going to look at a parable that's really a miracle, the moving of a mountain. So let's dive right in right now. Number one, the withered fig tree. What's this all about? Well, this is a lesson for you and I about fruitfulness. So here's Jesus. He walks up to this fig tree expecting to enjoy a fig breakfast. But when he gets there, even though there's leaves on the tree, there's no fruit. Now, Jesus already knew that. He's God, for goodness sakes. He knows uh, everything. So he simply pronounced the unfruitful condition of this tree as being uh, permanent. He looked at that tree and he said, hey, you don't have any fruit, so you're never going to have any fruit. And that tree, it withered right there on the spot. Now, there are some radical environmentalists out there who are known as tree huggers, and they wouldn't like this true account about Jesus uh, very much. Now, don't get me wrong here. I believe that we should be good stewards over our environment, but these radical environmentalists, they take things just a little bit uh, too far. And the first thing they'd say, if they read this true account, is they'd say, well, now what did that tree do to deserve this? Well, uh, first of all, Jesus, he's the creator of everything in the known universe and beyond. So he has the right to do whatever he wants to do with any tree that's out there. Secondly, Jesus is teaching a very valuable object lesson here to his disciples, not just those disciples back then, but you and I, the disciples of our time. You see, Jesus, he's going to be in a constant debate with the Jewish religious leaders over this uh, week here leading up uh, to the cross, right? And on the outside, these guys were hyper-righteous, but on the inside, these guys were absolutely dead. And we know right away that that's the application of this miracle parable because Jesus himself, just like Mrs. Smith, the Sunday school teacher, well, he gives us the moral of the story. You'll find it right in Matthew 21, verse 43. He says, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Back in the Old Testament, both Jeremiah and Hosea, they use a fig tree as a symbol for Israel. And that fig tree that was Israel, it was chopped down in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. The fig tree was chopped down, but the root wasn't destroyed. Look what Jesus had to say in the book of Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 and 33, when he was talking about our season of time right now, what we call uh, the last days. He said, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. And Jesus tells us elsewhere in Scripture that we, you and I, we should be able to read the signs of the times. In other words, we should be able to look around us at everything that's going on in the world, and we should be able to see where we are in Scripture. In other words, where we are in our season according to the biblical uh, timeline. And so, again, you and I, we should be paying attention to world events because, brothers and sisters, the fig tree has leaves again. In 1948, Israel, the fig tree, became a nation again for the first time since it withered all the way back in 70 AD. Now remember what I said earlier, Jesus's miracles and parables, they always have a literal and a spiritual application. The Bible should be read like that. It should be read literally and spiritually. However, beyond this specific application to the nation of Israel that I just told you about, there's also a very powerful personal application here. Outward activities, leaves, are worthless unless our individual lives reflect Jesus. In other words, reflect fruit. 
A fig leaf in the Bible represents self-righteousness. When Adam and Eve sinned and they realized they were naked, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. You'll find that in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, fig trees over there in Israel, they're a whole lot different than these fig bushes we have here in the United States of America. But either way, it would still take a whole lot of fig leaves to cover a person's nakedness. And that's why Adam and Eve had to weave a whole bunch of fig leaves together. Now, when God found them there in the garden and they confessed what they had done, God let them know that those fig leaves were not an adequate covering. And so what God did was he covered them with animal skins. And you'll find that in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 where it says the Lord God made garments of animal skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And so not only the first death, but the first blood sacrifice in the Bible happened right there in the Garden of Eden. And the reason that it happened was to uh, cover the shame and the sin of Adam and Eve. We don't know what kind of animal it was that God sacrificed, but don't be surprised when we get to heaven if we learn that it was a lamb. Now, I just told you that fig leaves in the Bible represent self-righteousness, but leaves on the whole in the Bible represent religious appearance and activity. Many professing Christians have an abundance of religious leaves, but no spiritual fruit. So what is fruit? We talk about fruit all the time in Christian circles, don't we? Well, fruit is the outward expression of an inner nature. It's really quite simple. If I see an apple hanging on a tree, I know it's an apple tree. That fruit, it's telling me the inner nature of that tree. And the fruit of a Christian is the life of Jesus revealed in our lives. Other people seeing Jesus in us. And the fruit of a Christian, part of the fruit of a Christian, is those nine character qualities that we find in the book of Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The scripture tells us that against such things like that, well, there is no law. But the real fruit of a Christian is another Christian. If I plant an apple seed and I nurture it the correct way, I'm going to get another apple tree that bears more apples, right? Well, as Christians, our responsibility, according to Scripture, is to plant the seed of the gospel and to continue to water it. So let me ask you, have you ever planted the seed of the gospel in another person to the point where God can make it grow? Because the Scripture is plain about it. We plant and we water, but only God uh, can make it grow. And the real key to bearing fruit is found in the book of John, chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit, because apart from me, you can accomplish nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown out like a branch and dries up. And such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire and are burned up. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My father is honored by this, that you bear much fruit and show that you are my disciples. You and I, we can't bear fruit on our own any more than an apple tree branch that's been ripped off of an apple tree and thrown on the ground can produce apples. You and I, uh, we can't produce fruit unless we're connected to the vine, unless we're connected to the uh, power source, unless we're connected to Jesus. And as the body of Christ, you and I together, we should be like a fruit rack displaying Jesus's life. Our job is is not to try and be good and imitate Jesus. Our daily job is to stay firmly connected to the vine that is Jesus. 
And as we do that, as we stay connected to the vine, as we stay connected to Jesus, his life-giving sap, the Holy Spirit flows in and through our lives. And the result of that is Jesus's life seen in each and every one of us. That's number one, the lesson of the withered fig tree. It's a lesson in fruitfulness. And now we're going to look at the mobile mountain. Man, this is a lesson about faith. And just as in the case of the withered fig tree, we're going to find a literal, a spiritual, and a personal application to the words of Jesus when it comes to moving a mountain. I want you to notice in our verses that when Jesus told the disciples, you can speak to this mountain and move it, they were on the Mount of Olives at the time. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 4 and 5, the prophet Zechariah, he predicted, he prophesied, if you will, that when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation for the final climactic battle over Jerusalem, his feet were going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. Check this out, Zechariah 14, 4 and 5. He says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Now, that's what I call a mountain moving experience. However, Jesus wasn't just referring to this prophecy right here from Zechariah when he told his disciples them back there and you and I here in our season that we could move a mountain. Jesus' words seem so outlandish that a lot of times people are tempted to simply spiritualize it and move on. A lot of times people look at Jesus' words, hey, you can uh, speak to this mountain and it'll move, and they take that as being symbolic, not literal. However, <laughs> there have been times in history when God literally moved a mountain. Let me give you a historical example. Let me just stop right here and say to you before I give you this example, I really do research all my illustrations before I bring them to you because there are a whole lot of historical urban myths floating around out there. But this uh, historical example I'm going to give you right now, it has a whole lot of a verification. It happened about a thousand years ago in a place that's still in the news today, the land of Egypt. God has a long history of performing miracles in Egypt. There was a Muslim majority back then in Egypt, just like there is today. And the head of that Muslim majority, the caliphate, was a caliph by the name of Al-Mu'iz. And he decided to challenge the Christians back then on their claim that Jesus was God. And so he brought in this pastor who was really the head of this whole Christian sect, a guy by the name of Anba Abram. And he gave this guy an ultimatum. But first, he read this verse from the Bible, Matthew 17, verse 20, where it says, If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. And so he challenged those Christians to prove the words of Jesus by moving a certain mountain. And he gave them a choice. He said, in three days, if that mountain doesn't move, I'm going to give you this choice. You can either die by the sword or you can convert to Islam. So what did those Christians do? Well, they fasted and prayed for three days. And on the third day, guess what? There was an earthquake and that mountain not only moved, it split in two. And as a result of that miracle, no Christians died by the sword. No Christians converted to Islam, but a whole lot of Muslims converted to Christianity. And a church began to meet in the chasm that was created by that earthquake. And so what proof do we have of this mountain moving account? Well, number one, Coptic Christians in Egypt still fast beginning every November 25th for those three days in memory of that miracle. And number two, that mountain on the outskirts of Cairo was renamed Makatam, which is Arabic for split in two. 
And number three, a strong church has been meeting in that same location for over 1,000 years. And the name of that church, well, it's called Cave Church. You can just look up Cave Church on whatever search engine you use, and you can see pictures of this a space where over 12,000 committed Christians worship Jesus on a regular basis. And so we see a spiritual application from the book of Zechariah. We see a literal application right here. But there's also a very powerful personal application for each and every one of us. When you face a mountain of challenge, faith in God can move it. Remember that great movie, The Sound of Music? Remember that great song in that movie, Climb Every Mountain? Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. <laughs> anyway. Some mountains uh, in our lives, they can be way too tall to climb and way too wide to uh, go around. And so Jesus gives us a better idea. He says, hey, just move that mountain. Now, I'm not much for those paraphrased Bibles out there, but I still look at them from time to time. And I really like the way the Message Bible paraphrases verse 17 of our verses today. Check it out. Jesus in the Message Bible here says, if you embrace this a kingdom life and don't doubt God, you'll not only do minor feats like I did to the fig tree, but also triumph over huge obstacles. This mountain, for instance, you'll tell it to go jump in the lake and it will jump. Again, mountains come in all shapes and sizes. We know what a mountain is in the literal, but what exactly is a mountain in the spiritual? Well, a mountain in the spiritual is any obstacle that blocks your path and stops your progress. It blocks your view of God. Is there a challenge that you're facing right now that looks like a huge mountain? Maybe there's a sickness or a disease mountain in your life. You feel like you're never going to get better. Maybe you're trying to lose weight or maybe trying to gain weight, gain some muscle, and it feels like you're never going to get healthy. Maybe it's a financial mountain and you feel like you're never going to get out of debt. Maybe it's a relationship mountain. Your relationship is on the rocks. Maybe you feel lonely. It's a mountain of loneliness. You feel like you don't have a friend in the world. Or maybe it's an immediate family member who you love uh, with all your heart, but they don't want anything uh, to do with you. And that mountain seems insurmountable. Well, let me give you a few mountain moving uh, tips. Number one, speak to the mountain, not about the mountain. Jesus basically just told you and I that we could confront our spiritual and emotional mountains and just tell them to uh, go jump in the lake. But I wonder how many of us actually speak to our mountains like that. How many of us actually speak to our problems like that? We talk about our problems. We talk about them a lot about them and we pray about them and prayer is important. But Jesus didn't tell us to talk about our mountains or just pray about them. He said, speak to them. Now, you might feel a little bit foolish speaking to a real mountain, much less an invisible mountain, a spiritual or emotional mountain. And I say invisible because other people can't see your mountain. But when Jesus was walking this earth, he spoke to a lot of things that other people probably thought were foolish. Jesus spoke to demons and evil spirits. Other people couldn't see them, but Jesus commanded them to come out of certain people and they came out. Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, told the wind and the waves to be still, and the wind and the waves, they got still real quick. In our verses today, we just saw Jesus speak to a fig tree, and it withered, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, that's Jesus, and Jesus is uh, God, but remember what Jesus just told his disciples, and again, not just those disciples back then, but you and I, the disciples of our day and our season right now. He said, hey, you can do the same thing 
to that mountain that I did to this fig tree. And I want to just stop right here and give a little disclaimer. Jesus wasn't teaching name it and claim it faith here. Name it and claim it faith redefines faith from trusting in our holy and sovereign God despite our circumstances to a way of controlling God to give us what we want. But back on point again, Jesus didn't say talk about your mountains. He said talk to your mountains. The truth is the more you talk about your mountains, the bigger they're going to get. That thing will grow and grow and grow until sometimes uh, you and I, we can actually turn a molehill into a mountain. Not to mention, if you don't speak to your mountain, it's going to speak to you. It will taunt you. It'll say, look at me. You can't get past me. It's going to say, you'll never kick that habit. You're never going to be healthy. You're never going to get out of debt. Nobody likes you. And when your mountain does that, don't fret about it. Don't uh, talk about it again. Speak directly to that mountain. You don't have to yell when you talk to your uh, mountain. Just stand firm in faith and say, mountain, there's not enough room for you and me both in this life. And so you got to go. That's number one. Speak to the mountain, not about the mountain. And number two, focus on God's power, not the size of the mountain. The Bible, it's full of stories about people who faced mountains, and sometimes those mountains were disguised as a difficult people. When David was a teenager, he brought food to his brothers who were soldiers on the front lines in a war against the Philistines. And there was a mountain of a man on the front lines of the Philistine army who was challenging the Israelites. His name was Goliath. This guy, Goliath, he not only taunted and insulted the armies of Israel, he taunted and insulted the living God himself. And nobody on the front lines of Israel's army uh, spoke to Goliath, but they all uh, spoke about him. They spoke about how big Goliath was, and the more they talked about it, the bigger and bigger uh, Goliath got. They were all in fear of Goliath. And here's little David. He shows up. He puts down the food that he brought for his brothers. He listened and heard everything that was going on. And he decided he was going to go on out there and speak to that giant. And so he starts walking towards him, talking. And then Goliath started speaking back to him. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 43 and 44, Goliath looked at David and said, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, his false gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. That's pretty scary stuff, huh? That's what mountains will do. They want to scare you, man. They want to strike fear into your heart. But little David, he stood firm in faith in the one true God, and he spoke back to that mountain of a man. And this is what he said again, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 47. David said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I'll strike you down and cut off your head this very day. I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. David said, it's time for you to get out of my way, uh, mountain. And of course, we all know the rest of the story. Yeah, Goliath lost his head. But what I want you to see is that David, he wasn't focusing on the size of the mountain. He was focusing on the size of the almighty God. The Israelite soldiers, they said, look how much bigger Goliath is than uh, me. But David said, look how much smaller he is than God. The Israelite soldiers, they said, Goliath is too big to fight. But David said, hey, he's too big to miss. 
So what about you today? When problems arise, do you complain to God about the size of your mountain? Instead, you should be telling that mountain about the size of your God. That's number two. Focus on God's power, not the size of the mountain. And number three, consider that if God doesn't move the mountain, he may move you. When you speak to your mountain, it may not move immediately. It may take time. So keep on talking to it. But there are some situations when we face a mountain of our own uh, making made from our bad choices. It might be a mountain of fear or a mountain of anger. It might be a mountain formed by unforgiveness on our part. None of us are immune from that. We all trip up now and then. But there are people out there who continually just drive ahead blindly and then they blame God for the mountain that's in their way. But the truth is they left the path God had them on of their own volition. And that's why sometimes God moves our mountains and sometimes God says, take another lap. Understand, God doesn't always move your mountain. Sometimes God moves you instead. Sometimes he gives you a different viewpoint of your mountain. You see, God has to move you sometimes uh, to a place where that mountain doesn't block your view of his grace. The Apostle Paul, he was a man of great faith and he moved many mountains. But in Acts chapter 16, he faced a mountain that didn't move. He wanted to go into Asia Minor, but he faced a mountain of difficulty. Check it out. The book of Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Messiah and went down to Atreos. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready. And of course, this is uh, Luke talking here. He's the writer of the book of Acts. He was Paul's physician. Luke says, We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so what we see is that in that case right there, God moved Paul instead of moving the mountain. Paul, he took the gospel into Greece instead of Asia. And that was the first time that the gospel had ever been uh, preached over there in what you and I know as Europe. The same thing happened with the Ethiopian eunuch. He had a mountain, man. He had a mountain of disunderstanding, not misunderstanding, just disunderstanding. He had questions and uh, he wanted answers. And so he traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem and he found favor with God there because in the temple they actually gave the Ethiopian eunuch a copy of the scroll of Isaiah. Let me tell you, that's favor. They didn't have copy machines back then. It took someone many, many months to write that scroll of the book of Isaiah. Nonetheless, the Ethiopian eunuch, he left Jerusalem. He was in a chariot. He finally stopped and he was looking at the scroll, but his questions weren't answered. So uh, what did God do? Well, God realized he was still this Ethiopian eunuch, still facing a mountain. So he sent the apostle Philip to preach the gospel to him. That Ethiopian eunuch, he received Jesus and the gospel was taken to the continent of of Africa uh, for the first time. So uh, what's the moral of all of that? Well, make sure that uh, your life is bearing fruit, not just displaying the leaves of religious appearance. Have faith in God. And remember, Jesus is the answer for everything. So speak to your mountain. And remember, if you can speak to your mountain, well, that means you're not afraid of your mountain faith. It can move mountains or it can move you. Either way, as always, it's a win-win situation with Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Until the next time you and I meet here on the Way the Word Ministries 
television ministry. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may God grant each and every one of you the desires of your heart all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody.